2000. Thank you so much, Nicole, uh, for inviting me. I'm honored to be here. I know much about the work of the Brennan Center. It's fantastic work, and um, so I'm proud and happy to be here. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about prosecutorial power before Thomas and I get engaged in a conversation with you all. Um, so prosecutors, why did I choose to focus on prosecutors, and why did I write this book in the first place? Um, at the time I started working on the book, there was almost almost all the focus was on police power and police discretion. And I know you guys work on those issues a lot as well. And that was well-deserved attention in terms of racial profiling. It's still a huge problem despite a lot of the efforts and the progress that's been made along those lines. But at that time, when I was thinking about these issues, there wasn't very much attention being paid to prosecutors and the power that they wield. And from my experience as a defender in D.C., I'd always been so fascinated and quite frankly shocked by the power of prosecutors and by the discretion that they wield. Uh, a lot of the stories that I tell in the book are from my own experiences at PBS, with the names of the prosecutors and of course the clients changed. Um, and I was, I was quite frankly shocked by how much, not, not so much the prosecutorial misconduct, which, which I will talk about a bit today, and that's shocking of course in and of itself, it's illegal, people understand that, but I was really quite frankly shocked by the power and discretion that prosecutors can legally exercise <coughs> that produce, quite frankly, outrageous, unjust <coughs> results. Right, that they are allowed to exercise power and discretion in ways that produce results that most reasonable people would agree are unjust results, and yet they're allowed to do it. And I, I was just, I thought that was odd. I thought that was strange. Um, I also thought it was strange that they were able to exercise that power um, in a democracy where we, you know, believe in transparency, where we believe in accountability, and we hold people accountable when we put them in power. And so for me, the notion that the most powerful individual in our criminal justice system, the most powerful official in the criminal <coughs> justice system is the least accountable, to me, I thought, can't that can't be. I have to research this and figure out why that is and why you know no one's mad about it except me. <laughs> and so that's sort of why I decided to do the research and write the book. So in doing the research, um, what I found out was what I believed from my own personal experience as a defender for 12 years and from what I've observed going on in our society in general is that yes, indeed, prosecutors are the most powerful individuals in our criminal justice system. Uh, and they wield that power primarily through the charging and plea bargaining decisions that they make. Right? Everybody talks about how you know police are the most powerful because they've got the discretion on the street, and that's true. For most crimes, not all, but for most, it's the police. The police are the people who sort of bring people into the system. But frankly, they can bring folks to the courthouse door, but that's it. It's the prosecutor who really entrenches a person into the system because prosecutors can stop it right there through their decision not to charge. But they have total discretion in deciding you know, whether to charge a person, what to charge them with, a wide range of discretion in that decision alone. Oftentimes they decide not to charge a person, even if there's probable cause and even if there's proof beyond a reasonable doubt. They can decide not to charge. And that decision combined with the decision of whether to offer a plea bargain, what that plea bargain should be, those two decisions, quite frankly, control the criminal justice system. And those two decisions oftentimes predetermine the outcome in criminal cases. Why do I say that? Um, we live in a criminal justice, we operate in a criminal justice system in which 95% in some jurisdictions like Texas, I understand is 98% of all criminal cases are resolved by way of a, a guilty plea. Right? I mean, people watch television all the time and Law and Order, one of the ten versions that's been out there, <laughs> and they think that there are all these trials going on across the country. No, there's a lot of guilty pleas going on. A lot of people pleading guilty. Very few people actually going to trial. And so because prosecutors control the guilty plea process, they decide whether there's going to be a plea offer. They don't have to offer a plea if they don't want to. Nobody can make them. They decide whether there's going to be a plea and what that plea is going to be. And especially if you're in a situation where you're talking about mandatory minimum sentences, that power is an incredible power. 
Because with mandatory minimum sentences, if a person is convicted of a mandatory minimum, they've got to serve all that time. And as you all, many of you in this room know, there are many mandatory minimum sentencing schemes on both the federal and state level. So if a prosecutor decides not to offer a plea and the person, a lot of people are afraid of taking the chance if I go to trial, even if I have a good defense, if I'm convicted, I'll have to do 10, 15, 20, 25 years in prison, <coughs> period. The judge has no discretion. It doesn't matter that I'm a first offender. It doesn't matter what my background is. I've got to do it. I'm afraid of that. If they're offering me a plea, to something less than that, even if it's five or six or seven years, I think I'll take this plea. I don't even want to talk about my right to trial. So that is a huge power that really, you know, give, puts them in a position of almost predetermining the outcome of criminal cases. So what's wrong with that? Well, there's a lot of things wrong with that. People say, well, what's wrong with guilty pleas? If you, if you plead guilty, confession's good for the soul. If you did and you say you did it, I mean, that's good. Everybody believes, you know, just tell, just, you just tell me you did it. Everything will be all right, as Chris Rock says in his routine. It'll be all right. Just tell me you did it. It'll be all right. Well, as in the Chris Rock routine, usually it's not all right if you just say you did it. Usually something bad's going to happen. So I'm not saying that we shouldn't have a plea bargaining system. The way that this plea bargaining system works, though, is one that's horrible. And we can talk more about that later in the Q&A if, if you like. But just quickly, the reason why I think it's horrible is because prosecutors control that process uh, in a way that, quite frankly, puts defenders in a position not that sometimes they can't even do their jobs, right? Because prosecute, the defenders have an ethical obligation to investigate every single case, to present to their clients the best defense possible, uh, to give their clients at least the option of knowing, look, you've got a defense, here's what it is, here's what your chances are. But a prosecutor can, and they <coughs> do, come up, you know, in many systems where they have these assembly line pleas, They'll come up to you know the defense attorney day one when they've had no opportunity to do any investigation at all and say, look, your guy's charged with um, robbery. I'll give him an assault with a dangerous weapon today. The plea offer expires at five o'clock. Take it or leave it. And it's like, wait a minute. You know what are you supposed to do as a defender? You've got to tell your client, but you can't even. You can say to look, you could have a great defense here, but I can't investigate it by five o'clock. <coughs> And so, you know, here's what the time you're facing if you go to trial, here's the time you're facing if you plead, a lot of times the clients will take it. Well, that to me is just unethical behavior all the way around. But prosecutors are putting people in that, in defenders in that position because they can't withhold information from their clients. At the same time, it puts them in a position of not actually being able to do their ethical job. So that's just one example. I'll, I'll leave that there. But that goes on. What I just described is not an extreme example at all. That goes on in courts from, courtrooms around the country. I'm not saying it's the truth in every jurisdiction, but it goes on a lot. So they will, they will that kind of power. What are some of the other issues that are problematic? There are a number of them. The, the prosecutors who exercise their, their discretion um, in ways that produce unjust results. So what are some of the unjust results? There are a lot of them. One is the topic of, was the topic of this conference that I know some of you came to yesterday at NYU. That's racial disparities in the criminal justice system, right? So prosecutors do exercise their discretion in ways that produce and perpetuate racial disparities in our criminal justice system. There's no question about that. There's a lot of evidence of that. There's many studies that show that. There's Supreme Court cases that include studies that show that on McCleskey on that. That's simply a fact. It happens. Um, how does it happen? It happens in many different ways, but I think one of the biggest problems, and we discussed this at the conference yesterday, is that prosecutors, like many other officials in our criminal justice system who have discretion, um, are themselves um, victims of, I should say, unconscious racism. You know, they, they, they are guilty of, I should say, unconscious racism. Like most human beings, by unconscious racism, I mean implicit bias. Many of you may have heard of these studies where people are discriminating, they're not discriminating intentionally, and they're not even aware that they're discriminating, right? They, they're, it's those instinctive reactions that we as human beings have when we see something, we automatically <coughs> react to it. There are all kinds of psychological studies about this. Prosecutors are no different, and there's so much evidence, uh, studies that have been done you know, across the board about how people react in a situation where there's potential where one could see a potential crime when when the face of the person is black, right? 
you know, yesterday the, there was a discussion about one uh, set of studies in which a video was shown where there were two individuals and the two individuals were actors and they were told to engage in behavior that looked like one of them was pushing the other one, right? And so then the audience was act, asked to respond, you know, what is going on in this scenario? Well, when both of the individuals were white, something like, I don't know, 70 something percent of the folks said, oh, they, it's just horseplay, they're just goofing around, right? Um, if, the, if, the one, if the person who did the pushing was black and the other person was white, same behavior, same push, exactly the same, something like 75 to 80 percent said, oh, that person is hurting that person, there's a crime going on. So there's just been a lot of research. Catherine Russell Brown wrote a book years ago called The Color of Crime. When people see a black face, they think criminal. There's so much evidence of that. And people in society suffer from it. Police officers certainly, when it comes to racial profiling, do. Individual citizens do, as we know from the Trayvon Martin case. And prosecutors do, too. I mean, they're no different from anyone else. And so when they are making their charging decisions, oftentimes they implicitly, I mean, I think unconsciously, I should say, make decisions that on their face appear to be race-neutral decisions, but in fact have a racial effect, right? And even some of our legal rules and regulations, the ABA standards for the prosecution function, for example, list a number of factors that prosecutors should take into account in deciding whether to charge a person and whether to make a plea offer. They are factors like the seriousness of the offense, uh, the defendant's prior record, the victim's interest in, in prosecution. Those are all factors that prosecutors prosecutors should take into account in deciding whether to charge and whether to make a plea up for them, right? So if, there's, if it's a really serious offense, of course, the idea is that they probably should charge um, and maybe should make a plea bargain depending on what a plea bargain might be. The defendant's prior record. If the person has a long prior record, maybe the, it would suggest that they shouldn't give them a good plea offer or shouldn't give them a plea offer at all or should come, you know, zealously prosecute them. The victim's interest in prosecution, the idea being that if the victim's not that interested in going forward, it's not their decision entirely, but if they're not, that's something to take into account in deciding whether to charge at all or certainly whether to give a plea offer rather than making that person sort of have to go through a trial. Well, all of those factors, we can all look at them and say, yeah, that makes sense, that makes sense, but even those race-neutral, seemingly sensible factors that we would all suggest prosecutors should take into account, they're, they're, they're race loaded, laden, whatever the phrase is. They all have racial <clears throat> effects. They all have racial effects, right? The seriousness of the offense. All kinds of studies and evidence to show that, you know, when there's a white victim and a black defendant, prosecutors see those cases as more serious. They do, because they seek harder charges. There's all kinds of studies showing that. The McCleskey case, some of you may be familiar with the Balder study that was done there. Uh, that showed that in the state of Georgia, when the study was done, that if the defendant was black and the victim was white, the defendant was 4.3 times more likely to receive a death sentence just because of that combination. And there have been many similar studies done since then with regard to the death penalty that have come out exactly the same way. And, and with other charges, not just with capital murder, right? So that's the seriousness of the offense. And it's an implicit thing. It's not explicitly stated. Um, the, 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 vic the interest of the victim in prosecution. Well, how do prosecutors figure that out? Well, if the victim doesn't show up for the grand jury or if they don't show up for the witness conference, well, I'll assume that they're not interested and I'm not going to go forward. Well, that's class and race late. Um, my sister used to live in Atlanta and her home was burglarized and she knew who did it. It was Marcus, the kid next door who she babysat and she was outraged that Marcus and his little friends broke into her house. <coughs> and so I was like, you know what, Marcus is having issues leaving alone. Nope, she showed up for every single meeting. She was early for the grand jury. She showed up for all of the prosecutors. <laughs> meetings. I'm like, you know, lay off Marcus. But, you know, she's a college professor, so she's able to show up. She can take off work whenever she wants to and show up. So, and, and so that's a you know, class issue. If you do day work and you don't show up for work one day and you lose your job, you, maybe you're not going to show up for the witness conference. And it's because, you know, you got more basic issues like I got to eat, so I'm not going to show up. That doesn't mean that I'm necessarily not interested in prosecuting. 
but the prosecutor's not going to chase after the victim who doesn't show up. And so it may turn out that a black and or poor victim's case is not prosecuted as zealously as a white and or wealthy person. I'm using them both because class and race, you know, conflate, intersect in so many ways, right? The poor are disproportionately African-American Latino and African-American Latino are disproportionately poor. So it's kind of hard to sort of pull apart the issues of race and class. You can in many instances, but sometimes you can't. So that's one, that even that issue, so, and, and it goes on and on, and so I think it's, it, it's so latent in the prosecution function that it's, it, it becomes difficult. So there, as you can see, there are many ways in which prosecutors, without even breaking the law, without even engaging in misconduct or doing anything that's unethical, can still perpetuate these race and class disparities in our criminal justice system. And so, the hard issue is how do we get around that and what do we do? And I can certainly talk more about that. Thomas is looking at me. How's my time? Time's fine. Okay. A few more minutes because I'll talk about race. I want to talk a little bit about prosecutorial misconduct and then we can sort of open it up. So, so just talk briefly about one issue, which, you know, the, the issue that we all, I think, can agree we don't want racial disparity, unwarranted racial disparity. Let me just be clear. When I say unwarranted racial disparities, I'm talking about similarly situated people in our criminal justice system being treated differently <coughs> based on race, right? Similarly situated people, meaning you've got a white defendant and a black defendant with the same criminal record, charged with the same thing, and they're being treated differently, right? Same thing with victims. So I'm talking about similarly situated people being treated differently. So unwarranted racial disparities, one that we can all, ones that we can all agree are unfair and shouldn't be there. So there's that issue, and that happens, can happen, can happen, and does happen often without prosecutors doing anything unethical, anything illegal. So that's the one. We got prosecutorial misconduct on the other hand, right? Which is illegal, right? The Supreme Court says that prosecutors may not engage in misconduct. There are many different forms of prosecutorial misconduct. There are forms that prosecutors engage in in the courtroom, in trial, you know, improper closing arguments you know, all kinds of things. I want to focus on Brady, though, which is this case called, case called um, Brady versus Maryland, a case in which the United States Supreme Court said that prosecutors have a constitutional <coughs> obligation to turn over exculpatory information to the defense. And you all are probably familiar with Brady because it's been all out. Everybody's heard of the Duke LaCrosse case and Mike Nifon, right? Everybody heard about that case. Well, that's when Brady, that's when the public discovered Brady, right? <laughs> I was quite frank, I was amazed by this case in so many ways because I was actually working on my book, the final parts of the book, and that, that case didn't actually make it into the the hardback version. You probably have the hardback version, but this one actually has an afterword that's so more updated the cold so, um, so in the afterword, I talk about the Duke, uh, the Duke Lacrosse case. But I was amazed because I'm sitting there and I like there's you know the CNN is on and you know they're breaking news. Everything is breaking news on CNN. Again. So, <laughs> so I'm like breaking news. Prosecutor fails to turn over exculpatory evidence, and I almost left. I was like, "That's breaking news." <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> all day, every day. Prosecutors are not turning over Brady, and it's now breaking news. Let me go look and see why it's breaking news. Sure enough, it's breaking news because it's a very wealthy young white man were, you know, charged and it wasn't turned over and they had the dream team that was able to discover this Brady like a needle in a haystack that no other lawyer would ever have been able to discover. And wow, you know, you look at these like, you know, handsome young men, blonde, you know, with their suits on, oh my God, they've been charged with rape and this black, you know, prostitute did it and then this pros prosecutor didn't even turn over this information and the country was outraged, right? Everybody was just outraged, you know? So I, I just found it such an interesting phenomenon because, you know, there have been people who on death row, undoubtedly people probably executed as a result of Brady violations. Um, Delma Banks, this brother from Texas who was on the gurney, like getting ready to die when the United States Supreme Court stayed his execution and eventually uh, reversed his conviction and, and the Brady violations in that case were way more egregious than Mike Nifon. But guess what happened to the prosecutor in his case? Nothing. 
He wasn't able to refer to bar counsel. Most of you all know that Mike Nifong was disbarred for what he did, and he should have been, but so should a lot of other prosecutors, but that's a whole other issue. But the point about Brady is that Brady violations, and I get in this argument with prosecutors all the time, the argument is that they say Brady's violations are terrible, but it's just a small problem. I think it's a big problem. Right, and there's actually been some research done. The Center for Public Integrity did a huge study back in 2003 in which they documented rampant, rampant prosecutorial misconduct around the country, specifically Brady violations. There have been other, interestingly enough, journalists who tend to discover these things, right? Um, they're responsible for a lot of the wrongful convicted people getting out, discovering, doing studies about wrongful convictions. The studies are there, are documented in my book, and there have been others since. So Brady violations are a huge problem. Recently, it's been in the news uh, more because of the Ted Stevens case. I don't know if you all remember the mm -hmm. senator from Alaska. There's a trial, and you see before the Honorable Judge uh, Emmett Sullivan, the prosecutors there not only didn't turn over Brady, but defied the judge when he told them to turn it over. They just refused to do it. Eric Holder, to his credit, came in and dismissed the case because he said uh, because of what they did. There was a huge 500-page report that investigation was done on the Shulkin report recently recently released, and now Lisa Murkowski, the, Repub the independent, I guess mm -hmm. she used to be Republican yeah, senator you. from Alaska who was good friends with Ted Stevens, you know, and he was killed in a car accident, I mean, a car accident, mm -hmm. in a plane mm -hmm. crash some years later. She has now introduced the, I forget what it's called, the fairness and disclosure of evidence, whatever, basically a federal law now demanding that prosecutors turn over Brady you know, because of what happened to her good friend, Ted Stevens. I'm like, wow, they really get it when somebody let them know it happens to them. They're like, this is an outrage. I'm like, where this has been going on to poor folk and people of color for decades, you know, longer than that, but sort of, it, you know, they, they finally get it. But the, the point is that it, it, there's a lot of attention being paid around that because there's a lot of evidence that prosecutors are routinely engaging in that those kinds of behaviors. There have been some efforts, not enough in, in my view, to sort of fix that. So I think probably I've been talking for longer than 20 minutes. I want to put those two issues out there. I do have some ideas about what can be done about, about um, that. I think I always tell people I think the weakest chapter of my book is the last one where I have ideas for reform. And I finally, my publisher said, you got to turn this in. I'm like, but I'm not for these ideas. I need more time. And they're like, no. So I put some ideas in the last chapter about what I think should be done, what folk can do to try to remedy some of these issues. Uh, and I can sort of talk more about that later, but I'll stop now. Well, actually, before, <coughs> before we take questions or even I start messing with you, um, <laughs> why don't we? Why don't you tell us a couple of the solutions? What, what, some of okay. the responses. Okay. I think that's a, a good place for us to start. Okay. So I, in terms of how do we remedy these problems, right? So this is let me first talk about the racial disparities issue. So that's a hard one. Um, the Supreme Court offers us no help on that issue because basically the Supreme Court has decided that when it comes to race discrimination in the criminal justice system, really really outside of the criminal justice system, but certainly in the criminal justice system, that you basically have no, you can't even bring a claim unless you can prove intentional discrimination in your individual case, right? Whether we're talking about prosecutors or police officers. So in the case called Wren versus United States, where there was, it was a sort of driving while black case where the cops stopped the person because they were black, everybody knew this, LDF filed a brief, whatever. Supreme Court in this decision says if cop has probable cause to believe you've committed a traffic offense, it really doesn't matter if the real reason they stop you is because you're black. If they can show that there's probable cause that you committed a traffic offense, you have no claim. If you want to bring a race discrimination claim, the Fourth Amendment is not the place to do it. Go to the Equal Protection Clause, and there you've got to prove intentional discrimination on the part of the cop. Now, how one proves that, I do not know, because the Supreme Court basically, statistical evidence, it has not accepted. So. Similarly, in McCluskey versus Kemp, the case I mentioned earlier, the case involving the man who was on death row, uh, Professor David Baldus, who died last year, a, just an amazing man. He did this uh, great, you know, statistically sound study in which he was able to, by examining thousands of homicide cases in the state of Georgia over this period of time, 
was able to show what I mentioned before, <coughs> that basically if the defendant is black and the victim is white, 4.3 times more likely to receive a death penalty, and there are other statistical results there that, that I, in the interest of time, I won't share. Went to the Supreme Court, Supreme Court said, yeah, this study, statistically sound, I get it, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the stats. However, if you can't prove that that prosecutor in that case discriminated, discriminated against you, this study by what happened in the state of Georgia does not prove that does not prove discrimination, does not prove intentional discrimination, you have no remedy. Another really horrible case called Armstrong versus the United States, which I also talk about in the book, was a case in which the Supreme Court said that if you're bringing a claim that prosecutors um, selectively engaged in selective prosecution, that is, that they're they're singling you out because of <coughs> your race in order to prosecute you, in order to, to get discovery. If you file a motion, in order to get discovery in support of your motion, you have to prove that similarly situated people could have been prosecuted. <coughs> similarly situated white people could have been prosecuted but were not. If you were able to show that, then you can get discovery. Because what the defendants were trying to do in that case is they asked in a discovery motion for the prosecutors to turn over all the evidence that they had of whites who were prosecuted in federal court because they were making the claim that in the state in California, this particular district, that the prosecutors were prosecuting all the black folks in federal court for drug and firearms offenses, all the white folks in state courts. The significance of that, the sentences, penalties, way higher in federal court. And they had anecdotal evidence, but didn't have the statistics they need, so they filed a motion for discovery. Prosecutors basically said, we don't have, they didn't say, they didn't turn it over, they just said, we don't have to turn that over, we don't have to turn it over. They didn't say they didn't have this, we don't have to turn it over. Trial court said, yes, you do. They appeal with the Supreme Court. Supreme Court said, no, they don't have to turn it over. In order to get them to just turn over the statistics, you've got to show that similarly situated people could have been prosecuted but were not. And I'm thinking, if you can show that similarly situated people could have been prosecuted but were not, you should win the whole selective prosecution motion, right? I mean, what more would you have to show to show selective prosecution? They're saying you've got to show that to get discovery. So it's a crazy decision. I mean, that makes no sense. But that's what we're dealing with in the United States Supreme Court. So litigating, to me, there's no hope. Now, I've given up on the Supreme Court. I, I did a long time ago in many different ways. But on this issue, <laughs> certainly I have. So I just feel like for the race issue, I think the work that they're doing at the Beer Institute, I don't know if you all are familiar with the Prosecution and Racial Justice Project over there. I'm a big champion of that work because it's, it's all about doing the sort of baldest-like studies in individual prosecutors offices to try to show that there are really these unintended unintended racial consequences of race neutral decision making in prosecutors offices because a lot of us there are not, I would say there are some prosecutors that are decent folk who are like you know what we're not racially discriminating. If you can show that we are, I'm stopping it right now. I mean, no, the R word is a bad word. That people don't want to be called racist. And so there are actually some who will say, all of them will say we're not doing it. But there are some who will say we're certainly not intentionally doing it. And if you can show us how we're unintentionally doing it and there's a way we can fix it without threatening public safety, we'll do it. So the Vera Institute has started this project, and they've actually gotten four chief prosecutors uh, to engage in this process and allow their statisticians to go into their office and do these kinds of studies to show them at various decision points where they're making decisions that have racial effects. Mm -hmm. And most recently, the Manhattan DA has agreed to, to participate. And so it should be really interesting to see how that turns out. How is that going to affect systemic change? Well, that isn't. But for me, the idea is that it could start a movement. So if you get, you've got prosecutors, chief prosecutors who are credible in the prosecution community, who will stand up and say, I did this in my office, the sky didn't fall, and in fact, you know, and it didn't threaten public safety, and now I actually have the respect of my community because they see I care about these issues, and I made some changes in my office that were that I could do because I have all this power and discretion. Nobody can tell me what to do because I'm a prosecutor. And not only did nothing bad happen, but something good happened. And so if that could happen, I feel as if it could start a movement. I feel like we need to elect progressive-minded prosecutors, educate them about this problem, and hold them accountable. And I think they can do something about it. On the, on the misconduct side, again, Supreme Court, no help. Um, and I talk about why you, know, you have to show harmless error. They rarely reverse convictions based on brave violations, rarely. 
So I think the ethical, the ethical process, the bar referral process, if it, if it were done the way it's supposed to be done, could be a deterrent to prosecutorial. I mean, usually on prosecutor today, he might be disbarred or she might be disbarred, you won't pull their ticket. They get scared. I mean, right after, I, I was talking to a D.C. Superior Court judge right after Mike Knife on this barman, and he was saying, just like in the weeks after that, prosecutors would turn it over Brady and left their <laughs> right. It was just like, whoa, you know, I don't want that to happen to me. Of course, you know, after that memory faded, it was business as usual, but I do think that that can be a turn. If they really believe, if the, if the bar referral process was an effective one, and it is not, and again, I talk about this in the book, there are very few prosecutors nationwide who've ever even been referred to bar counsel, even when judges make findings on the record of prosecutorial misconduct. Rarely are they ever referred to bar counsel, and the few that are, nothing happens to them. Mike Nifong is the only one I know of who was disbarred for a Brady violation, and I have my views about why that happened in that particular case with those particular uh, defendants. But it just never happens. So I think if we had an effective, if the first of all, the, the model rules of professional responsibility that most states have adopted as their ethical rules in their states are weak when it comes to prosecution. So there's one rule, 3.8, that applies to the prosecution function and is weak for a variety of reasons. It really doesn't address a lot of different issues. But more importantly, it does address Brady, though. And, but, and so that brings me to the next point. But more importantly, the process for referring people to bar counsel and holding them accountable is just weak and non-existent. And so prosecutors aren't afraid of it because it's not working. So I feel as if we strengthen that, that that could make an impact on the prosecutorial misconduct side. So I'll, I have other ideas too, but public education campaigns, I think we need to educate the public so that they can hold elected prosecutors accountable right now. That's a joke. People just, the prosecutors, local prosecutors, they tend to stay in office for a long time, 10, 20, 30 years. They run on a post most times. You don't even know what they do, and they just check the box or not check the box. We need to start running progressive people for office and getting them elected as prosecutors like Craig Watkins. You guys heard of Craig Watkins in Dallas, this African-American man who was a defender and ended up becoming, I don't know how that happened in Dallas, <laughs> but he became the DA for Dallas. The first thing he did was set up an innocence project in the, in the office there and proceed to free all these folks who were wrongfully convicted. And I was like, wow, and I kept thinking, you know, He's never going to get reelected, but you know, <laughs> he's going to do a lot of good in four years, and guess what? He got reelected, you know? And I was shocked. So it gives me hope. So those are just a couple of the ideas that I have about Dallas. Okay.